I want to ask you, how much did you get roasted by your players this season? Oren, <laughs> unceasingly, incessantly. Hello everyone and welcome back to Geek Peak. My name is Oren and today I'm interviewing Brendan Lee Mulligan about Never After. This is the 16th season of Dimension 20 and this interview was chaotic. I have a lot of fan questions, we talked about the season, production, and a lot of stuff about it. Uh, you are going to enjoy this interview very much. Before we head into it, please click the like button because that helps me a ton. And while you're down there, please click the subscribe button and the notification bell to keep in touch. So without further ado, enjoy the interview. Brennan, welcome to the show. Hello! It's so great to have you again. Uh, I am so excited for this interview. And I have a lot of questions for you. So we'll begin with our usual one. What's the inspiration behind Never After? The inspiration behind Never After. We've been wanting to do something with fairy tales for a long time. And I think that uh, fairy tales are very interesting because it's an earlier type of mythic sort of fantasy than high fantasy, the, the, the one that sort of generated um, Dungeons and Dragons, right? If you look at sort of, if you, if you look at Tolkien and the idea of developing a non-Earth mythical world, and you see all of the sort of like, you know, the, the structure that comes from that and that D&D &D then borrows... There's also some, something sort of incredibly exciting and fun about going to an even earlier iteration of fairy tales, which are so weird and so different and obviously a part of, you know, world myth and folklore and kind of occupying this strange, like, you know, very, very popularized during this like post printing press time period, but also like based on stories and legends that are far older than that. And then weirdly also dreamlike in their quality you know like the amount of times that like characters in fairy tales don't even have a name or the land that they're in is not ref you know it's like sort of in a lot of ways fairy tales are like the opposite of like a fantasy storytelling if you think of fantasy storytelling as like a book with a map at the front middle earth westeros right and then you think of fairy tales as being like there once was a land and you're like that's all you're getting <laughs> There was a land. <laughs> That's it. You're not getting anything else. Um, so we were excited to do fairy tales because it felt like a very different type of fantasy to do. And then in thinking about what's the funniest genre to mix with fairy tales, but that still kind of makes sense, I think we got to horror really quickly. Because, you know, you think of these like Mother Goose, little nursery rhymes, fairy tales, stuff for kids. And then you scratch the surface and you're like, this is the most deeply haunted shit I've ever encountered it's so freaky and scary um so doing like a very uh to us there's a lot of comedy in the mixing of horror and fairy tale okay uh this is going to reassure a lot of people uh because like uh i will get to the fan questions later but there are so many people who are worried that uh, this season, as a horror season, will not stay true to the language uh, that Dimension 20 has started with, which was comedy. Uh, oh, oh, ye of little faith. I, uh... <laughs> Come on, Come on <laughs> guys. What are you so nervous for? You think we're going to instill the show? Uh, it, honestly, I, I don't want people to be nervous, but the fact that people are nervous does sort of make me a little... <laughs> There's a little villainous part of me that's like, ooh, you should be scared. It's going to be seven people talking about a make -em up around a table. You know what I mean? It's not – There's the, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre guy is not going to come into the dome. You know, It's very much us still telling a story. Now, there are going to be some really freaky and spooky and kind of horrifying moments. But also there's hours and hours and hours of us laughing our asses off and being around the table. So – Dimension 20, first and foremost, 100% is always a comedy. It is a comedy show. Um, and just like 
We've had, you know, moments of high drama with a crown of candy, or we've done like true mystery with like mice and murder. This is using horror. And there's going to be a lot of very faithful horror moments in the show. But fundamentally, it's also, by the way, very much a fairy tale story. Like it's got both in equal measure. Like there are parts of the storytelling that are very much loyal to fairy tale structure, right? Uh, and have a lot of that. So I think people weirdly, I think there will be people that are like, this is so scary. And there's also going to be horror enthusiasts that are like, what the hell? This is all lighthearted and funny. So, you know, we're trying to honor all of the genres, as we always do every time we do a big mashup that includes and honors a lot of genres within it. Um, I do not think loyal Dimension 20 fans will be... Um, will find the show unrecognizable. I think it will be exactly the show they've always known and loved, just with a cool new genre that we're having fun playing with. Okay, awesome. That I think that is what everyone wanted to hear. Uh, we can all take a deep breath now. <laughs> it's okay. I the yeah the the all everyone take a deep breath. I'm not, no, nothing bad's going to happen. There's going to be some little scary moments, but I promise. Something jumps at you. <laughs> I promise. Yeah, there's going to be one where I pull the ring out of your laptop. I'm going to shoot out of your screen and I'm going to go, roll for initiative. Um, <laughs> no, it's going to be wonderful. Listen, there will be some scary moments, but we're not, I don't, I don't see us as. Go, we don't, we ne everything scary that we do in the show is v very much in the spirit of making a piece of entertainment. We're not, we're not trying to like push the envelope and actually like really f like, you know, we're not trying to antagonize anyone watching the show. I think there's some fun little scares, v big Halloween town vibes, big, big night, you know, like that's our job, but we're not mean vibes for anyone who's a fan of the Nightmare Before Christmas. Um, so yeah, I think people will have a ball. I think it's going to be a, a, as much of a hoot and a holler and so much fun and tons and tons of laughter like many seasons before. Awesome. So in terms of like preparing to tell a horror story, uh, what went into the process of like you as uh, the DM of, for this season and the players, uh, who, who, who built their characters to, uh, like make certain uh, uh, that making sure they're, they are staying true to this, to the vibe of this season. How do you, uh, uh, how do you prepare to tell a horror story? I think the way you prepare, prepare to tell a horror story in actual play, certainly. And if you're going to do a long season, you're going to have like, you know, 20 episodes. I think the way that you have to prepare is to invest in a richness of character that that kind of firmly puts you in a certain type of horror. So these characters, for example, um, the like the protagonist, the, the protagonists of like a slasher horror film, don't necessarily need the degree of character development that a character would need over like a 20 episode television series. Right. And the reason being is that the motivations and perspective of someone who's trying to not get ax murdered are really self-evident. Like as soon as someone's running away from an ax murderer, I kind of identify with them. I'm like, yeah, man, I don't want to get ax murdered either. I get this guy. So <laughs> there's, <laughs> there's a certain degree Horror does a really good job of, of giving you something really primal to relate to in its protagonists, right? People that are trying to survive. Um, with this season of Dimension 20, um, I think that we wanted to have not just external facing horror, but also a lot of internal facing horror, which to me, as, like, mm -hmm. as a philosophy major and also as... Um, Someone who just loves to watch the intrepid heroes, the, you know, the, my, like the best, you know, these are like the best players ever grappling with that performance of a character who doesn't just have enemies without, right? They also have some enemies within. There's also that idea of what are you struggling with? And specifically within Never After, there's, I think, a lot of like, that idea of times of horror or of horror coming to a place or of being somewhere and how you react to it. 
and the fact that some of the ways in which we react and respond to horror uh, are in themselves kind of horrifying, right? There's a lot of those moments we see in horror where, like, the response that otherwise normal people take to X, Y, or Z thing uh, becomes pretty chilling in and of itself. Um, this season, I think you're going to see a lot of like hearkening back. There's a lot of moments in other seasons that I think told me I wanted to come to this genre and wanted to prepare for it. You know, Baron from the Baronies in sophomore <laughs> year, or uh, some of the some of the more chilling moments in like A Crown of Candy. There were a lot of those things where I was like, "Ooh, it'd be really fun." to go to a freaky world. So there are some moments of actual like f fright, but I would say even more than that, there's a lot of, mo there's, there's whole beats and thematic chapters of like dread of something that's a little bit more ambient and a little bit more dealing with the philosophical and about like your relationship to the unsettlingness of this universe. Okay. That's so cool. I you describe it in like in in such a thrilling way. Um, it's thrilling. I'm really proud of this season. Also, I have to say, not only did the intrepid heroes absolutely smash it, the entire crew this season popped all the way off. It was nuts. Rick Perry, Michael Shawbuck, mad lads. Uh, uh, <laughs> our, uh, Tyler and Jared, our editors, incredible. Um, just everyone, uh, uh, Ebony Harden, um, was on this season. Who's been our producer, you know, since way back fantasy high, uh, episode one, uh, uh wow. you know, uh, HMU shout out to Denise Valentine, um, uh, Kevin and Graham, our camera department. There's a, and there's a lot of things you can see from the trailer stuff is going on with the dome. That's a first time yes. for us. And, uh, Maron, it's just beautiful. And all the rest of the crew, it's been the whole art team. There's, you know, everyone that came on that set was just like a brilliant genius and it's a pleasure and a joy to work with them. Uh, so this season is the, the technical side of this season, I think people are going to get absolutely blown away by it's I, I, all I do is I'm watching edits this season is going, I'm stunned. I'm like stunned by what I'm seeing. <laughs> okay. So you mentioned two things here that I want to, uh, uh, like poke some, uh, some into, uh, the first thing is the 20 episodes, uh, mm. for this, for this season. Uh, I think this is, Yes, this is the first season of Dimension 20 that has 20 episodes. Yeah. Uh, is this the new normal or was this just like a nuanced uh, occasion for this specific story? This is sort of, I think, I think going to be a new normal. Um, okay. we're doing, we're doing 20 episodes now. We've come a long way. I mean, the last, the last, uh, you know, even since Starstruck, which, w which we shot, yeah, like a year, like, like we, we stopped, you know, we stopped shooting like a year and change a year and a month, a year and two months ago. Um, uh, with, within that, within that world, um, I think we, we wanted to, we, first of all, we have like a new, we're like the studio space is new and a bunch and dropout has made, made a bunch of investments in the show and things are exciting and going forward. Um, so I think 20 is the new normal for the most part. Uh, we did have one season that was longer than 20 episodes, which was sophomore year, but that was obviously weird because it was a live show and it was weekly. But so sophomore year, I think had like, I could be wrong, but like 25, 21, Somewhere in the low twenties, I think. No, so. twenty-five, certainly not. <laughs> Let me see here. Um, this is when you have to Wikipedia your own show. Hold on. <laughs> How many episodes? Sophomore year fantasy high. Why did I write it like that? Um, okay, let's see here. Dimension Twenty Live. Uh, how many episodes were there? Okay. Oh. There were also 20 episodes, but there were two live shows. So there was the, there was the RTX and then Boys Night oh, okay. for Roll20 yeah. Con. And then I guess we also have the, the, the one in Brooklyn with Brian David Gilbert, which is not part of this season necessarily, but that's also floating right there. So 20 episodes. Okay. So yes, we, we are now matching the episode length of sophomore year. Awesome. Okay. Uh, good to hear that this is the new normal. I like it. Uh, uh, more, more Dimension 20 across the 52 weeks of the year 
is good for us. Uh, and the second thing that I wanted to uh, mention was um, that you said about the the dome. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I want to ask you, what can we expect in terms of uh, new mechanics in the dome this year? <laughs> It's really cool. Um, the, we are all, I don't want to give too many spoilers, but I think you've already seen some in the trailer. Yes. Right? So we brought in, not only do we have Kevin Stiller, who's worked with us so many times, we also had Graham Sheldon, who's an awesome, another awesome DP. Both of them were working on this season um, uh, that came in with, a we had a designer that was sort of working bridging you know Rick Perry in the art department with the camera department and Kevin and Graham um, uh, uh, we had uh, another projectionist sort of come in we had like uh, Matthew LaForest who's our head of tech come in and like organize the kind of you know mechanics of it but essentially for, for one of the first times um, there was so I will say the dome, the projections, otherworldly. There are some actual, uh, like in studio sounds as well. So you'll be able to, you'll be watching, be like, what am I looking? And you'll see players react to things that normally would only have been sound effects sort of in post. And, uh, fundamentally, and it's a thing that I don't think you'll ever see referenced, but it's huge for me is the dome is now partially under my control as well. Okay. Now, which is now in the past, me and Shawbach were like, we're like, you know, uh, we're like birds in a murmuration, you know, we're like fish in a school. We were swimming in perfect <laughs> synchronicity. Um, but what that tool allows of, of me being able to set up some of those projections or some of those other effects within the dome is to really work on timing and to have, in other words, rather than Shawbach listening to me and following my cue, I can set up my own cue so that we get these moments because, you know, horror is really rooted in timing. So there's a lot of those kind of timing things there. And it's really fun to have that kind of flexibility. And the, again, the crew did this amazing job of putting the dome together. Like, you know, it's a tight turnaround in the dropout studios. I think we had like three days from when the season of Game Changer wrapped to then setting up this whole new incredible projection thing. And oh boy, they just knocked it out of the park. And the lighting as well. I mean, like just the, the gels, the lighting, everything set into there. It's just like, mwah, it's beautiful. That's so amazing. Um, mm. Also, like this feels like there's inspiration here from... Uh, the season of sophomore year where you were like uh, doing the music uh, in yes. the live show. <laughs> yes. Which is really great. I mean, that's always the sort of like, um, that's, that's my, that's my tech technical white whale. Cause in my home games, I play ambient music. I have like music playing that the players can hear, but for sound reasons, we sort of can't do that. So, you know, maybe there'll be one day where I can, I can pipe music directly into the cast's brains and then it will record <laughs> separately, but the microphones won't pick it up so we can get the audio clean. You know, we'll figure it out. We'll, we'll get, we'll get brainwave brain radio, brain, brain dio. <laughs> Or uh, there could be an AI that would make the music in the vibe that you want, and it will be free. There you go. <laughs> How about that? <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, let's see. Oh, the most important question. How does it feel to go back to doing physical minis again? Ah, uh, so... Awesome. So, that's right. Because let me see the last. Because because so Jasmine was our first GM with Coffin Run to jump back to Rick Perry physical minis. And let me tell you, having these physical minis, oof. The the <laughs> gang they've really done it up in Washington in, in Rick's kingdom of miniatures up there. Um, Shout out to, to Katie McGeorge and Marcel and so many great uh, uh, painters and, you know, uh, artists and sculptors. Um, it was amazing. Having, having these sets, it's just so damn cool. And it's very fun, too. I mean, you know, there's going to be a, you know, there's like 
similarities as well between like a crown of candy and doing this stuff because a crown of candy was based on game of thrones which is very like um which has that element of verisimilitude and it's you know it's the opposite of like superhero comics it's like very it's not it's not like kapow it's like gritty scary combat and this is very similar the combat in this is like you know we're in that horror world so there's some encounters that are <laughs> challenging and the way like the the level of ominousness ominosity <laughs> I'm an I'm, an I'm, I'm, I'm the foreigner. Don't ask me <laughs> English questions. <laughs> Let's go with ominosity. Um, uh, the the degree of dread uh, in these different <laughs> battle sets is so so good. Rick, he's, he's the man. It was and coming up with these battles was like really really fun. Um, and it's just I think there's something so delightful in these battles too of like taking classic fairy tales and finding these extremely sinister interpretations of them and taking like very classic visuals and then rendering them through this lens of horror is like, it was just so fun. All the battle sets are mwah, chef's kiss. Okay. So we have like battle sets and you also mentioned uh, a crown of candy. What can you tell us about like the world building of this season? The world building for the season is really interesting. And all I will say to fans of this, and this is where we actually, this is, this is maybe one of the first seasons where like talking too much about the world building almost starts to verge on spoilery. So there's an interesting thing okay. here where uh, I will say the world of like, like with a lot of horror, you don't see the shark for a while. You don't see jaws for a while. And like, there will be a, 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 there's a creeping piece of mystery in and around the world building. And I would just say to our audience that is watching at home uh, that there's so much about the world building that I'm excited to share, but the never after is indeed wrapped within the times of shadow and will take its dreadful time in revealing its true nature to our audience. So there's a lot of fun. This is, this is a season that I had the, I've had the most fun with kind of having a lot of cards very close to the chest and making our PCs really fight for every little bit of light they can in a world shrouded in darkness. Okay. You said it's such a sinister vibe okay i'll leave it at that um about uh the the pcs the characters this season is there anything mm -hmm. you can tell us uh about them like before even the show begins uh yeah i mean well you can see them in the in the trailer i believe they have this yes. the intros so they're classic fairy tale characters right there's uh lou is pinocchio zach is puss in boots siobhan sleeping beauty emily's little red riding hood uh ally's mother goose and uh murph is uh the frog prince and uh absolutely classic characters um really really the way everyone plays them is so fun uh if you think there's anything fun to say about the characters some strong vocal choices were made and i'll tell you right now they are committed to so like <laughs> so lou. If you're like i love it so much lou not only nails the voice so, rock solid. There's no like if you go around like shaking the, wow. the like structure of a house, like shaking the, shaking the two by fours before the walls go up. Like it's rock solid. That voice committed the whole way through. It's so so funny. Um, yeah, I think that like this season is very driven by the players. It's very dominated by the players. There's a lot in terms of like coming from their perspective. Uh, especially like in this sort of sense of horror of like accompanying them through the confusion and the chaos and a lot of the sort of like sense of dread in the world. Um, and also some of the funniest moments, I mean, moments of true, like racking my side. Also, I will say, I think there was enough real life stress in some of the episodes because it's horror. So there's moments where you're like, Oh my God, are we going to make it? You know, are we going to survive? There are some adventuring parties in this season that 
I've never been in a more chaotic like interaction anywhere in my life. Like there are adventuring parties that I'm amazed we caught it on camera of just of people like needing to cut loose after, you know, two hours of, of creeping dread. <laughs> and then, you know, they're like, ah! so it's going to be very, very fun. I uh, tune into the adventuring parties this season. is all I'll say. Okay. Uh, before we move to the fan questions, I want to ask you, how much did you get roasted by your players this season? Warren, <laughs> unceasingly, incessantly, the, I have, the, because when you, when you come into, like, even in playful times, there's that antagonistic relationship between myself and, and my beloved intrepid heroes. And in those moments where, uh, <laughs> and I came to this season, like, it's horror. I'm going to get you. And they were like, ah! <laughs> just the level of, uh, uh, yeah, we, we hit, we hit real peak of like, I, I got, I got roasted. I got absolutely roasted. So there'll be some, some great beats, some great moments of me getting my ass handed to me this season for everyone at home. Um, and and in a funny way too, not only of, the, of me getting roasted by the players at the table, but also getting roasted by their play. There's some really incredible play, like mechanically, in this season as well, um, where you know these guys fire on all cylinders in terms of trying to avoid the fate that the Never After has in store mm. for them. Amazing. Okay, let's do some fan questions. I got a lot of them. Tracy asks. How scary is Never After going to be? Or what is the ratio of scary to comedy hijinks? I have watched every season of Dimension 20, but sometimes horror is a lot for me. How nervous should I be? Are there more relaxed, funny moments in every episode where viewers can have time to breathe? Yes. To answer your question, there will absolutely be moments. And I think this will, like, I, I, I would say, like, Talk to your friends after they watch episode one and you will see how much, uh, uh, you know, people, people will be able to determine for themselves and your friends will be able to talk to you. It's, it's a comedy show. It's fundamentally a comedy show. And, and also there's, again, a lot of fairy tale stuff in it. Um, you know, horror is not, you can have a constant horror in a two hour movie over like, what is this? 20 times two, it's like 40 hours of content. There's a lot of beats within the never after that are just straight fairy tale beats, right? That would be, they're very recognizable as just fairy tale. And then of course, like more than 50% of it is the intrepid heroes having a ball is like laughing, doing bits together. So like, you know, you're, you're going to see, yeah, this show is going to, uh, absolutely satisfy the desire for camaraderie and comfort and laughter and seeing your friends hang out and have a ball watching, you know, uh, have a ball playing D D together. Um, so fear not, except in very small moments where we would ask you to fear. <laughs> okay. Abby asks, what is your favorite episode or battle this season? Favorite episode or battle this season? I love them all. I really, I really, really love them all. I think that there are some very unique ones. But that doesn't necessarily mean they're my favorite. Gosh. I, 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 I don't know that I can. I don't have a favorite. They're all my children. All of them are my children and I can't, I can't pick a favorite. Okay. Great. Uh, you can, you can, if you wanted to say something, I know you, you don't want to spoil things, uh, but uh, you can tell us something that when we get to see it, we will recognize it as uh, the thing that you meant. If you want. Uh, I think when you start to see the, the ink, think the ink, that's all I'll say. Ink. Write it down, folks. Okay, um, Reina, easy. <laughs> Reina asks, what's the most fun thing that you get to do to establish amb ambience in a Tales Gone Wrong horror campaign? 
Um, the projections. I mean, those projections are, are in terms of ambiance, like having those projections behind everybody is such a boon and it made everything feel so visceral and real. And also I think what's fun too, just on a level of people watching the episodes is when you have those projections, when the dome is static, the player's focus is all right at the table, which is normally a very good thing. It's like, we're focused on the board. We're focused on the screen. We're focused on each other. Having the projections was really great for a horror season because it made everybody do this of like <laughs> turning to like, ah, like what's behind me. Right. Um, and having that feeling of being, of being a little bit smaller than the world rather, you know, when, cause the dome and the table naturally invites you to kind of feel like a Titan. You feel like an Olympian, you know, in those old, like, um, uh, not Ray Bradbury. I was confused. Ray Bradbury. It's Harryhausen. Um, uh, the, let me see, hold on a second. Um, yes, the Clash of the Titans, right? Or, or, where did, where did he, yeah. So, like, those Ray Harryhausen, uh, uh, movies of, like, you know, the Olympian gods standing over a pool and determining the fate of these little characters within it. So the projections are great in terms of having something actually loom over the players, which is very fun. Um, uh, that's the biggest ambiance setting for sure. Okay, that's amazing. Uh, Off Kilter asks, after a particularly after a particularly emotional or heavy session, how do you like to check in with your players? Similarly, how can I as a player support my GM through the drop after a story ends? I check in by saying I'm checking in. I was going to up and be like, hey, I'm checking in. How are you doing? Um, uh, I will say that trust is huge. So obviously the thing that makes checking in way easier is if you have a relationship based around already doing that and it becomes something regular rather than kind of like unusual. You're like, hey, just always checking in, right? Like uh, good, good to develop that habit. I think it's a good habit to have. Um, and then um, in terms of how to support your GM. I would say the same thing. I would just say like, um, it doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be a huge deal. If that makes sense. Like having it be having emotional care, be routine is actually pretty helpful. It's like hygiene, brushing your teeth, right? You're checking in after, after a session. And like, are you already in the habit of after a session ends having a little three to five minutes just to like babble and be excited and talk about how great it was? Do you have a little ritual around like, Hey, like I want to talk to you sometime this week before our next session about stuff I'm thinking about for my character. Right. Um, so I think that like my best advice for, for helping your GM after an ending of something is to like develop a routine around kind of doing that to begin with. But if that is a lot of work, then at the very least you can like make a point to uh, show them that you care. DMing is a lot of work. It's just nice to show that you care. Okay. Um, Caitlin Cluever asks, how many NPCs do you create with a backstory and name for a campaign like this? Or are most of the NPCs made up on the spot? Well, uh, sh certainly some of them are always made up on the spot, but this one was very unique in that I was drawing from source material already. So I did tons of research and we had a bunch of amazing consultants this season, um, and jumped in, you know, who do we have? We, the, 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 had awesome consultations with, uh, Jasmine Buller and Sam DeLev, Bria Iyengar, Erica Ishii, Jian Shim, so just a crew of really brilliant, uh, amazing people. Um, so with, with some deep folklore knowledge, which was really great fairy tales and legends and everything like that. Um, so I had a list of like a huge amount of fairy tale characters, uh, with their stories. And I didn't so much have them have written backstory for them as I had their, them, I read their stories and just, you know, I have a pretty good memory of like, okay, that's everyone's story. That's where they're all from. And then I had some ideas around how I thought they might have been corrupted or how I thought they might have been changed or how horror would have like impacted or affected them. Um, and then, you know, some of them I kind of assigned to places and locations in like the long arc or plot of the season. And then others I, um, 
sort of had up my sleeve, like ready to sort of drop at a moment's notice if need be. Uh, so it was a, a mixture, a mixture of those different tactics. Okay. This next one is from Kyle from Texas. And uh, we, I, I got a, a, a variation of this uh, question a lot. Uh, Kyle was the first. Given the explicit horror vibes of this season, I think most fans are assuming this season will have some high lethality elements, much like a crown of candy. Is that assumption true? And did the characters, did the cast have backup characters at the ready? What an interesting <laughs> question. <laughs> I will say in, in response to this question, I will say, uh, w these are some very, uh, uh, I cannot fault any of your logic in these observations. Observations. <laughs> uh, I cannot fault any of your logic in these observations. And that's all I can say. Okay. Awesome. <laughs> um, did DMing for Calamity inspire you to go a little bit harder and farther away from comedy in this season? I would say that we pro I probably knew Starstruck was so fun and wild and goofy. And, you know, it's almost like, you know, you're just, it's Dimension 20 is a variety pack. It's an anthology show. So I think I was like, ooh, what are we going to do to change things up from start? We just always like to change. We want to do something we haven't done before. Um, so I think there was already on my mind, but certainly doing Calamity did make me go like, ooh, that's like, uh, uh, there's a fun itch to scratch there. It'd be fun to run with the intrepid heroes through something a little bit stranger and weirder and more sinister in tone. So I think that like Calamity was was great in terms of being a, a fun tonal stretch, but I was certainly not trying to like Calamity was drama. This is very much comedy and calamity was tragedy. And this is very much horror, but I think calamity felt like a great stretch of like tonal difference. So that was really uh, engaging and exciting. Okay. Uh, I didn't mention this question was from Alex E. Um, mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Alex. And the next question is from Jacob. What kind of safety tools do you use at the table? How do you navigate difficult subject matter and make sure everyone has a good time? Uh, X card, lines and veils, you know, the, the classics. Um, I would say that, again, the, the, the primary safety tool. Where you, so we have those formal safety tools. In addition to that, if I can anticipate that something is going to be challenging in an upcoming episode... I hip my players to that in advance. I, ch I chat with them about it to the degree that it is not necessarily, I try to avoid it being a spoiler, but if I, f but usually there's a way to communicate a level of comfort in advance of something without it constituting a spoiler being like, Hey, we might explain, what if we explored this sort of broad area or what if we went into this part of a character's backstory? So I think getting some, collaborative enthusiasm for topics that you are interested in exploring that may be challenging. Um, and then th I know I said it before, but I'll just come back to trust again, which is a huge thing, right? Like we have those formal tools there for a reason, but also most of how we bridge, bridge those gaps is informal, meaning that meaning that we all feel such a level of trust with each other, which I think is something that, is, is also part of it, right? Like I, I want to make sure that people that are playing at home have the formal safety tools, have lines and veils, have the X card, but are not using that as a substitute for building trust, checking in with each other, communicating clearly, like those two things work in tandem. And I think for me and the intrepid heroes, it's, it's a lot of at this point, that informality that we feel really comfortable and deputized to just check in and say stuff. Um, that being said, off the top of my head, I can't really remember too many instances of that happening this season, because I think that what 
pre-discussion does is getting on the same page ahead of time. So in pitching the season concept, in the world building, in the character creation, talking about backstory, checking in before episodes, all of that is trying to create a scenario where, for the most part, you go through an episode and everybody's totally into it. And you get to the end and you go, that was awesome, right? Which is what the preach, you know, like, um, you know, was that measure twice, cut once, or like a, sti a stitch in time saves nine, like checking in, you know, checking in ahead of time, like, you know, what one stitch in a garment in time will save you from needing nine stitches later, checking in ahead of um, a session and having those conversations early on can make it so that everyone feels totally safe and secure, even exploring scary topics as they go through um, uh, an episode together and you get to the end and, you know, everyone feels great. And, and there was no, and safety tools were available, but did not need to be used because there were check-ins ahead of time. Okay. That's awesome. Um, Mercury asks the question on a scale from one to calamity, how broken will this leave us? A scale of one to calamity. How broken will this leave us? Uh, I think that, that. My hope is that <laughs> my hope is that nobody is ever broken, and I would hope that no one was broken by calamity either. I think that there are going to be um, what was what would be the what would be the term I would use here? I think if you are broken by never after, it will uh, only be to come back. Uh, uh, patchwork pieced together, re-glued, fused into something stranger and stronger than you were before. So that's okay. my hope for anyone that gets broken by Never After. Awesome. Uh, Sammy, or Sammy, asks, this season looks like it's going to be beautifully horrifying, but I can also tell from the, tra from the trailer, we can expect some of the same hilarious shenanigans we've come to expect from my favorite cast, how do you, as a DM, balance creating that atmosphere with making room for them to riff? I think they go hand in hand, right? Um, you know, I, I think that um, monotony doesn't really exist in nature. Um, you know, you watch, you watch. Um, M movies, genre films, right? Whether it's a horror or whether it's, uh, you know, like, a, uh, I, I always kind of think of like the sort of Chris Nolan Batman movies as like, it feels like there's one synthy drone that comes on in the it, second one and is there the whole movie just going like, bah. <laughs> This is serious. It's serious. And you're just like, okay, this is serious. And I don't, and it just <laughs> feels very, um, doesn't feel n quite natural to me, which I guess is not what it's going for. So no, no shade. But there are, there's something about like the, there's something very easy to me about the idea of like, horror comes in to interrupt some other t it's not sustainable like you can't like literally i don't i don't think your brain can like peak that amount of adrenaline for that long right <clears throat> even like mice when they get bit by a snake they go limp they're like well i'm getting eaten there's no there's no point in being scared anymore right um I think that that none of these tones are possible to persevere for forty hours, right? It's not. It's not actually. Po it's not even possible. So when there's when people are talking about like balance, like how do you balance a tone? I guess my response would be like, how do you not? How do you not have a shifting in tone? People's response to fear when they get out of the frightening situation is often to either go into shock and sometimes going into shock prompts laughter or prompts like, oh, my God, I can't believe we made it out of that. Right. So at least that's me. I remember, you know, the the moments in my life where I've experienced shock did a, a sudden, incredibly dangerous or frightening thing. Almost always it's like laughter once you've cleared the danger. Right. Um, yeah. The so, piece of story near, the, near, near Niagara Falls. Yes, exactly. Exactly. You're laughing, baby. You're laughing. Um, 
So uh, I would say that balancing those tones is pretty pretty second nature, and I think maps more to reality. Like I don't see that as being unusual. I see that as being like a faithful depiction of human nature. Okay. Um, Melissa asks, "Hi, Brennan. I'm so excited for Never After. My question is." How did character creation work for this particular campaign? Did the classic fairy tale figures come first, or or were they proposed by Siobhan, Emily, Lou, Ali, and Zach, respectively? Uh, uh, oh, uh, so so every so so character creation was them picking which fairy tales they wanted to be. So they came with their and they came with a couple. It was sort of a conversation of, because of being like, oh, what, what, how many, like, what are your top three? And then we kind of talked about the top three that each of them had, and they pitched sort of like, here's what I think that character would be doing. Here's how I think they would behave or how they would act. Here's my take on them. And then we settled on the six that people were the most psyched to play. Awesome. This question comes from Dees. If you were a player in the world of Never After, what fairy tale character would you have liked to play? Ooh, Fear Not. I would have wanted to play Fear Not. Fear Not is a, a, a deep cut, but it's in Jim Henson's The Storyteller. Um, it's a little boy who cannot be afraid. Um, and I think that's so goddamn freaky. Um, the story of the youth who went forth to learn what fear was. Um, uh, father had two sons. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. So basically it's about, it's about a little boy who cannot feel fear. Um, uh, and I think that's so freaky and cool and strange. And uh, I, if that would, that would have been my, my, if I was playing a fairy tale, I would have played fear or not. Okay. Brennan, we're at the end of our little interview. And before I let you go, I want you to tell us where people can find the show. And I want you to also convince us that we are going to love it. You may find Never After uh, at dropout.tv. Uh, you can sign up for a free trial right now. If you want to check out other stuff, it's also at youtube.com slash dimension 20 show. We got a bunch of free seasons up there. If you want to peruse and check it out, uh, you can find me at Brennan Lee Mulligan, uh, on, um, Instagram. You can find me, I guess for, for the moment at Brennan LM on Twitter. We'll see how long that lasts. I'm also at Brennan LM on hive, which it seems like everyone's migrating to now. Oh, I need uh, to follow you there too. <laughs> uh, and, um, uh, it, I need to, you know, I do not feel it is my my job to convince you that you will love Never After. Um, what I will say is that we loved Never After. Uh, the cast and the crew are tremendously proud of what we did. Uh, I will never insist that any of the people who have been kind enough to watch the show to this point, um, you know, I will, I will never cajole or Hector anybody. I will merely say that we're really proud of it. We're excited to share it with you. And I think it is a classic dimension 20 season with the cast and crew just absolutely humming at the top of their ability. The engine is roaring on this season and it's so exciting and gratifying to be able to share it. Hey, thanks so much for listening to this episode of Geek Peak. If you liked it, please give this video a like as it helps it spread and reach to more people. And if you want to listen to the next one, it's right here. See you there.